of a ring of steel around the city. Despite Saddam's threat of a human barrier to stop the Americans coming in, they have arrived. And you know, not a shot has been fired in anger against them. How about that? To venture out was a calculated risk, but an irresistible one. We'd heard no gunfire, and there were enough Iraqi cars on the road to give us confidence. One of the first places we reached was an office used by Saddam Hussein's secret police. Here, his numerous portraits were going up in flames. At last, ordinary Iraqis were showing their true feelings towards their leader. When people saw our camera, they couldn't hide their delight at the turn of events. Further on, we spoke to some civilians who told me how they felt. Saddam going. Yes. Saddam going. Saddam. I am happy. I am yeah, happy. Free. Feeling free. Freedom, freedom. Then, all of a sudden, the United States Marines showed up. on the streets of the Iraqi capital. Hello, we're from British television. The Americans gestured for us to come and meet them. How you doing? My name's John Irvine. Sorry, come on, how you doing? From ITN. Nice, to, nice meet to meet you, Sergeant. You yes, say? yes, sir. Welcome to Baghdad. Oh, thank you. How does it feel to be here? Oh, it feels pretty good. I mean, it's nice to you know, represent the Marine Corps here. And uh, Gulf 223 out of Los Alamitos, California. Right. So, when did you guys get in? Uh, we've been uh, here exactly. Yeah. We've been here. Uh, we just got here about a week ago. Right. And okay. uh, when, did been... you, when did you get into Baghdad? Baghdad, just just now. Well, actually, last night. And what sort of welcome have you had from ordinary people here? I'm very lucky, man. Oh, how are you doing? Uh, nice to meet you, sir. You? We wait you a long time. Oh, yes. You know that? We've been we've been waiting to come here a long time, sir. But we need uh, finish uh, very uh, quick. Yes, sir. Not like in 1991. Right. Hamid is our Iraqi driver. Thank you. They are the, uh, the cache of weapons was in this civilian truck. They had all the uh, RPGs, AK-47s on this uh, civilian truck here. Right, OK. The Marines were destroying Iraqi weaponry they'd find in the back of a lorry. The soldiers appeared relaxed. Some were clearly exhausted, but others were keen to talk about their experiences. What sort of response have you had from, from ordinary civilians you've come across? Actually, the civilians have been very uh, cooperative. They're uh, pretty cheerful that we're here, and uh, we haven't had any conflict with them whatsoever. One of the men was a veteran of the first Gulf War. The, uh, the first Gulf War is pretty much we had a clear-cut objective. We had to push all the uh, Iraqis out of Kuwait, push them up back towards Iraq. Um, everything was pretty much wide in the open, um, just keep heading south, and everything we saw was enemy. This time, as we go through, we have a civilian population to worry about. And um, it's kind of hard for us because we have to judge between the civilian and military. And uh, it's easy for us to win the war by completely destroying everything in front of us. But that's not what we want to do. Several Marines were guarding the hotel that had been the base for the UN weapons inspectors in Baghdad. Looters had been here, and the Americans rescued UN cars before they were driven away. At one point, the soldiers thought they were coming under fire. Behind the white truck. Snipers got eyes on, sir. They're looking right now. The snipers with eyes on were two Marine sharpshooters on the hotel roof, but they weren't needed. Eventually, the Marine commander decided that the Iraqi gunfire was probably more celebratory than aggressive. These men are part of a company of 200 American Marines who fought their way into Baghdad last night. They are pleased with their accomplishments so far and remain confident. They don't believe this war is over yet, but they do believe it's nearing an end. And indeed, that came very quickly. Just a few hours later, the US cavalry rolled straight into the city center unopposed. What a formidable force this was. The Americans mightn't yet control Baghdad in its entirety, but they do hold all the important parts. A war of three weeks has brought an end to decades of Iraqi misery. 
John Irvine, ITV News, in liberated Baghdad. In Kurdish northern Iraq, an explosion of joy. The people of Erbil and other towns have been following every development in this war. Many move their families further north, out of range of Saddam's missiles. Today they saw the regime crack and they surged out into the streets, finally convinced that Saddam's rule is finished. No one is more pleased to see the apparent downfall of the Iraqi regime than the Kurdish people of northern Iraq. For them, the name Saddam Hussein has meant years of repression, of war, of being driven out of their homes and forced to live as refugees, and even of gas attacks like the tragedy of Halabja. As you can see, the moment of his downfall is here a moment of triumph. The Kurdish region has been free of Saddam's rule for a decade, but it has still lived in fear of him. Today, people didn't hesitate to say what they think about the dying Iraqi regime. We don't forget the crimes that committed Saddam throughout. It is rain. Of course, I'm happy. I must be happy because it's my uh, liberation of my country, and we believe that United States and coalition are liberated of country, and that's why we are very happy. Saddam said no. There were chants of support and gratitude for the American president. Here in the north, the question now is how long the frontline battles will go on. In spite of the bombing, the Iraqi army is still hanging on in front of the cities of Mosul and Kirkuk. But American troops are becoming ever more visible. And this afternoon, we saw Kurdish reinforcements men from both the region's political factions mixed together, heading for the front. It's rumored that an attempt to break the Iraqi army in the north is imminent. The Iraqi front line, the northern uh, front line, is crumbling. In fact, they have been under intensive air attacks and pressures uh, from the Peshmerga, from the US forces, whom we are working and cooperating very closely. And uh, just a matter of days until this news reached them of what's happening uh, in Baghdad, elsewhere in Iraq, that they would uh, also could melt away or surrender. People here now believe that it's only a matter of time before they join their fellow Kurds in Mosul and Kirkuk, celebrating in the streets. Julian Mannion, ITV News, in Erbil, northern Iraq. From Baghdad reached Basra fast. <laughs> Saddam is finished, they cried, apart from one last stand. They said, no go from Iraq. Kill in Iraq. He will die in Iraq. Who, who die here now? Saddam is in Iraq, in Baghdad. No go. Iraqis here are astonished, even by news from their own city. There is now no law, little order, and lots of looting here. Half a dozen huge warehouses stripped today of soap, sugar, flour, anything these people could haul out. If British troops are needed anywhere, they're needed here, but they're nowhere to be seen. Their judgment is they're not a police force, but there's a fine line between that judgment and complete anarchy. You need police in this place to know, give the people this food. Across the city in the banking district, there were British troops and there was mayhem. No, no, no. The man is terrified. He's part of a crowd that attacked a bank with rocket propelled grenades. The looters carrying one of their own who was killed. The crowd is small, the troops are nervous. This is a city teetering on the edge of anarchy. This is from Iraqi people. Why broken these? Why broken? The troops check the vault behind the safe door for looters or loot, but there's nothing. In an attempt to gain entry to the vault, um, firing grenades into it, they've actually incinerated all of the money that they're after in the first place. There's no Iraqi police, no Iraqi army. Do you feel you're in control? Um, yes, we are. We're fully in control at the moment of the city. But they're not sure where the thieves will strike next. You've got the ammunition, you've got the position to do something. Well, next target is leafy residential suburbs, and Margaret Hitchcock, originally from Plymouth, is furious. They're frightened from the people breaking into their houses, breaking into their houses, 
hurting them, causing trouble. I mean, who are these these, people? These people have been let out of prison. They're people from long uh, places away, not here. We want to restore some order here. You can do it. You've got the guns. You've got the machines. East Basra, where the Saddam Hussein grain warehouse is about to disappear. So if this in part is Basra today, will it be Baghdad tomorrow? A people fired up, a regime up in flames, a country out of control. The most senior British officer in Iraq is not concerned. On that, and I've just been in uh, all over downtown Basra, and I actually don't see any looting, uh, one or two isolated bits. Bits everywhere. It's not robbery, but revenge at the headquarters of Saddam's Ba'ath Party, where Iraqis look for the records of the relatives the regime has murdered. A new Iraq is being born tonight, but here and in Baghdad, it is a difficult birth. Bill Neely, ITV News, Basra. We ventured onto the streets this morning, not knowing what to expect. To our surprise, people were out and about, but they were worried. Law and order had broken down. They were unsure and suspicious. And Iraqi government? Where is the Iraqi government? We don't know. We don't know. The president? Where is the president? We don't know. We don't know. Well, nobody wants someone to be uh, occupied by another country. Uh, We'd rather be occupied by our own people. So I think that all all they're doing is for the oil. It's not for us or not for anyone else. They want for themselves. So I think they're going to be worse than whatever we've seen before. At the UN office, we found people looting computers, office furniture, anything they could carry or drag along the road or stuff in a car boot. We saw the debris of yesterday's battle under the flyover. People didn't know if they dared go past the point where the Americans had taped off the road. We saw armed men on the prowl. Then we found one of their victims and took him to hospital. Them had been shot in the leg by one of the Fedayeen. A few miles to the east, at the Olympic Committee building, previously the fiefdom of Saddam Hussein's son Uday, things were changing. The Fedayeen were long gone. This was one of the first of the ubiquitous images on which the people vented their anger. 30 years of frustration and repression exploding in a single moment. The looting was wholesale, the size of booty no deterrent. Part of it was simple theft, but people also wanted to take revenge on a government which has repressed them for so long, to take from the regime, to seize for themselves, while there was no authority to stop them. We went out again in the afternoon and found that everything was different. Oh, 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 what's that big thing? The Americans were here, in force. Hey guys! Fritz! We're English! Hey guys! We're English! We didn't know what reception we'd get. Nor did the Iraqis tentatively peering out. But there was no mistaking the message. The 3rd Battalion 4th Marines had taken control. Well, there's no question that they're here. We're now half a mile from the Palestine Hotel. It's the middle of the afternoon, quarter past three. And here are the Abrams tanks with the Marines, right in the center of Baghdad people on their balconies and around, just having a look, some putting up their hands, some cheering, some just silent, and watching the American takeover of the capital of Iraq. The tanks remained at the junction for more than an hour, observing, surveying, checking out the people. And the people did the same, watching to see what the Americans would do. The hopes and fears of both sides were contained in this scene in the middle of Baghdad. The Marines, fearing that amongst the crowd would be a militiaman ready to throw a grenade. Some Iraqis terrified that they'd make the wrong move and all that firepower would turn on them. All they have to do is just stay there uh, for their own safety. If they walk back through, they could be in danger. But if they just stay still, we'll pass them right up mm-hmm. and uh, they'll, they'll be okay. But if they start moving around, going in and out of the buildings, that makes people nervous. So if they just stay still, sit down, let us drive right past them, be safe. What okay. kind of resistance have you met, if any, so far? Uh, not much. Not much. Okay. Yeah, the best thing people can do right now is just stay in their homes and stay out of sight. 
Then one family decided to break the ice. A traditional Arab kiss between men and a gift. That, of course, was the reception the Marines were hoping for. These units crossed the border from Kuwait on the first day of the war. They've been building up to this moment, believing, as their leaders told them, that they would be welcome in Baghdad. And how have the people been reacting to you? Uh, they seem that to be real happy that we're here. They wave, we wave back, being real nice. They seem to think that it's a good thing that we're here, I think. And what do you think of Baghdad so far? I haven't been in very long, just a couple days now. It looks like they've been repressed for a while, so hopefully we can do some good and help them out. Okay, where, how long, uh, where did you come from this morning? Um, honestly, I don't know, man. <laughs> We've been back a few miles, just moved up. Down a side street, people were losing their inhibitions. There are hundreds, no thousands, of pictures like this to be slashed, torn or destroyed any way the people choose. And people were ready to talk. If they're coming to liberate us, then fine. If they're coming for other reasons, then no, we're an Islamic country. But just liberation, a thousand thanks. We're delighted the Americans have arrived. We were a people oppressed, hurt by the regime of Saddam Hussein. That was the reaction when we asked what had happened to the Ba'ath Party. They fled two days ago, they said, and good riddance. I asked the old man if the war had been necessary. For this fellow Saddam Hussein, yes, he said. If you said anything against him, he'd cut your neck. There was no other way. The battle tanks rumbled on, this junction secured, pacified. They were moving up to the Palestine Hotel, gradually taking the city corner by corner, street by street. Always cautious, looking for threats, taking nothing for granted. The militiamen are still out there somewhere. They parked at the traffic circle outside the hotel. Journalists and Iraqis came out to look. There was still the distant boom of battle. This isn't over. More people will lose their lives in this country. More force will be used. But today was the end of Saddam Hussein as president of Iraq. Neither the Iraqi people nor the American soldiers know where he is, but his icon was right there. First, they put the American flag, but maybe someone told them that wasn't the point. So they wrapped the Iraqi flag around it instead. They had brought a tank recovery vehicle. A noose was round his neck. One last pull. Goodbye, sit down. And the symbol of unfettered power and fear came crashing down. There it goes. There it goes. Freud and battered. This morning it was dangerous on the streets. We saw armed militiamen and heard gunfire as we drove around. It was only on the edge of the city that we found US troops. I approached cautiously, waving a white flag. Hello, gentlemen, we're from British Television. The Marines told me they were protecting this site, the former UN headquarters, because they'd earlier been looting here. When we got here, the UN uh, here was getting looted, the vehicles were getting ripped into, windows broken, and uh, we stopped that, televisions, computers, and things like that. We just put a stop to it. As the Marines checked vehicles, the situation was tense. People appeared to be taking pot shots against them. We've now taken cover. That's because we've heard gunfire from that direction. The troops say it's been like this for much of the day. Sporadic gunfire coming from all directions. The Marines told me they'd soon be in the city centre. Within two hours, they were. The speed of their advance surprised locals. Marines took up their positions, cautious at first. American armor was placed all around the Palestine Hotel and nearby road junctions. Is this what you expected? You're in the center of Baghdad now. Um, it's not exactly what we expected. Uh, I expected a little more hostilities uh, coming up into the streets of Baghdad. 
being as, such big of a city as it is. We haven't had a lot of opposition. We have had a few here and here and there, but um, hopefully I do think it, it is over. Well, you've come into Baghdad, the very little opposition, about where Saddam's troops are. They seem to have melted away. Are you concerned they might be hiding, ready to strike you with guerrilla operations? Well, yes, that's always a concern. Uh, we've run into quite a few of that uh, exact operations down the road, so that's always a concern. These, uh, who knows where they're going, and that's what we need to find. Local people were at first as cautious as the troops. Slowly they came out bearing gifts, flowers, and cigarettes. So how does it make you feel what these people are saying to you? I feel great right now. I, I didn't expect this much love from the people, but they're really showing it, and I, I appreciate it. I'm glad I did what I did. U.S. Marines in the center of Baghdad, right beside the Palestine Hotel. It's exactly 24 hours since I interviewed the Iraqi Minister of Information in the hotel. Today, he and all his officials have disappeared, as has Saddam Hussein's regime. When that dramatic news began to sink in, more and more people came out on the streets. Down, Saddam. I love you, Bush. I love you, USA. Down, down, Saddam. Even now, things were still tense. This man was searched. Marines spotted a package in his trousers. It turned out to be his money, hundreds of Iraqi dinar, because of the inflation here, worth just a few pounds. The crowds had been getting bigger and bigger in the square. The people had just one target. The whereabouts of the now former Iraqi president remains a mystery. His face is everywhere in this city but slowly those images are also being toppled. James Bay's Baghdad, Five News. Right now we're inside one of the uh, outer buildings of the university. We couldn't use a light out of doors. There is strict light discipline that the Marines observe, so that's why we're in here. Uh, right now out on the streets, at least in this neighborhood, in this area that the Marines are patrolling, it is quiet. Uh, there is no signs, no sounds of celebration out on the streets right now. There is sort of that nervous feeling that comes upon any city in questionable times like this after the sun sets and darkness sets in. Um, there has also been some explosions in the distance. We're not sure if these are demolitions of caches of weapons, but you see large explosions illuminating in the sky and the thunder of that explosion rumbling past. Uh, most of the city in this region is still in blackout. It doesn't appear that they have electricity. Only a few pinpoints of light can be seen every now and then. The Marines have established a base out by the university campus, and now they are pushing even into the darkness, patrolling streets with their night vision, with their armored personnel carriers, and with their heavily armed jeeps. They have established corridors of supply, corridors of passage that they can move along. There still are threats of snipers, and occasionally the threat of artillery, but otherwise they say they have strong avenues back to the, all their supply lines, and they are now patrolling throughout the streets here. Uh, I was told uh, one of the first things that was done after the sun had set, actually, when the Marines had moved in, was they went to the home of Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz. He lives, apparently, in this neighborhood. He was not there. But they went through the home of the Marines and said they were very impressed about how nice a home he had. And they were also surprised to find that the furniture had been covered with sheets, as if whoever left was intending to come back someday and reclaim it all. That does not appear likely to happen. Zane? And the, the others. And we just want to get rid of him these days. And let's wait and see what America are hitting for us. Everyone's focus fell on the statue of Saddam the symbol of his regime. Tell me, will you bring this statue down? At first, they tried to knock it down using a sledgehammer. The Americans brought in a tank recovery vehicle to finish the job. One over-exuberant Marine couldn't resist a bit of flag-waving patriotism first. The stars and stripes were taken down and replaced by the Iraqi flag. <laughs> then the moment of history.
the moment Saddam's regime could finally be said to be at an end. The Americans began this war.